Thank you very much for the invitation to launch this book. Uh, when I was asked to do a forward for it, I never thought I'd also be asked to launch it. <laughs> and I value both requests very greatly indeed. Professor Sabrici contributed so much, the people around him contributed so much. I'm not going to talk much about the book. Many of you would know what he has done in more detail and much better than I do. And it's much better to read the book than to hear it from me, or even pass it from me. But I want to talk about its importance, because it's a valuable book that Professor Sibritsky's life was an extraordinarily valuable life, and especially to Australia. I, I want to try and put the experiences and ask you perhaps to think of some things which some of you are old enough to know, but maybe not everyone. Because we've had a very difficult history in terms of race and religion, and we are facing a new period of difficulty, and it's going to take many Zubriskis Many people of courage and many people of determination to cure some of the problems that we're currently facing. The Australia began with white Australia very firmly entrenched in the minds of those early Australians. Even though Chinese and Afghans had come here in great numbers through the 19th century, um, the new Australia didn't really want them. It didn't really want Aboriginals. And we can't even agree as a country about the history of Australia with Aboriginals. <coughs> There's one view which says, you know, the black armband band view of Australian history is entirely false and entirely wrong. I was having a that's with a friend of mine who lives, I won't get any closer to identification than say on the, the other side of Port Phillip Bay, the <laughs> Peninsula. And uh, he's a bit older than I am. And he was talking about a conversation um, that he heard his father and his uncle having in the 1920s in Victoria. And they were farmers. And they were bored on Sunday. They'd been to church on Sunday morning. So they decided to go hunting after lunch on Sunday. And when they came back on Sunday evening, um, wife says, did you have a good day, darling? No, it was very boring. We only got one. Well, they weren't shooting kangaroos or emus or rabbits or foxes. Now that was in the 1920s. Um, one of the protectors of Aboriginals from Queensland, which might surprise you, in 1928 wanted to provide services to purebred Aboriginal communities throughout Queensland. But in those days, Queensland was far ahead of much of the rest of the Commonwealth. That protector of Aboriginals almost got run out of town, as it were, because the others all said, no, if we do nothing, they're all going to die out, and that's what we want. Mm. Now, that's part of Australian history, which there's great division in this country, and it's not yet resolved, not yet adequately resolved, at least. But leaving indigenous Australia aside, and the, there were no great wars in Australia, but there was violence right across the country as white settlement pressed out into areas and Aboriginals were pushed further and further into drier and um, more difficult places. The, uh, when the First World War came around, a year or two before, a young Catholic bishop had arrived in Australia 
Daniel Maddox. And I think he was, uh, I'm not a Catholic, so I'm brought up a Protestant, but I think he was a very, very great Australian. And not from the pulpit, but from, uh, was speaking to a suburban newspaper in the city. He said he was against conscription because it would make an unequal commitment even more unequal in that war, the first war. And uh, his argument, his reasoning, I thought was sound. He had, or the British, had got a commitment to, from Australia to keep five fully equipped divisions on the Western Front. And volunteerism wasn't keeping up with the meat grinder of, of that war. And then the British asked for another division. And that was clearly going to involve conscription. There was one premises and then another premises. There was legal power to bring in conscription without the vote. But he committed himself, Billy Hughes. And he saw somewhere that Archbishop uh, Daniel Mannix had said, I think in the Brunswick newspaper, uh, no, he was against conscription. He wasn't against the German war, but it would make an unequal commitment even more unequal. Because the casualties for our numbers were enormously high. We were a very, very small country in those days. <coughs> and Billy Hughes saw this, the little digger, great hero to many, said, ah, I'll win the Pelosos if I turn it into an anti-Catholic and anti-Irish vote. He lost twice. For the second time, Daniel Maddox defied the Catholic hierarchy and determined to fight and defend himself. Because he was being called a traitor. Um, Catholics were being told that they weren't Australians because they had their allegiance to the Pope. And people who served in the Western Front believed this. My father was one of them. And uh, it led to divisions within families, communities, which endured for nearly 50 years. If there hadn't been a settlement of the Irish question, an initial settlement in 1922, I really believe that there would have been armed conflict between Catholic and Protestant in Australia. There would have been, there were many professions that now try to forget it. But they would not allow Catholics to practice in their profession. Because they thought they weren't Australian, or for whatever reason. They were qualified, they'd done their university degree, but they would not register them in their professional associations. And so as a consequence, and one thing our founding fathers were very sensible, section 116 in the Constitution makes it impossible for the Commonwealth to legislate um, in a discriminatory way against, or even for, any religion. And if that had not been there in those early days, Billy Hughes would have legislated against Catholics. In later days, somebody would have legislated against Muslims. But it is there. But then a great many Catholics therefore joined the public service because they couldn't be denied on the basis of religion. And this became a papal plot to take over the Commonwealth from the back door. <laughs> now as a child I heard discussions amongst adults which were saying these things with great seriousness, with great sense of determination. But it divided families, it destroyed families, it created enormous division. And when politicians start playing politics with race or religion, they do massive harm, they arouse emotions which are going to burn and motivate people for better or for worse, not just for a little while, but for many decades. And that's what happened with that particular division. Didn't start to die until Menzies introduced some policies in the middle late 50s 
began to ameliorate some of the injustices. And uh, it uh, probably 1960s, 1970s, you could see remnants of it. So much harm was done. Now when we come to a post-Second World War Australia, we all believed that we were not defensible with a small population of seven million people, so there had to be a great migration. Arthur Caldwell, he said, though possible, it wasn't, I think, an intentional deception, he hoped that 90% of new migrants would come from Britain. Well, probably 90% came mostly from Europe, and there were so many people who had been disfranchised, lost their homes as their Soviet Union was given possession of Eastern Europe for so long. And uh, tens upon tens of thousands came to Australia. Hundreds of thousands. Now in those days, if there was a problem, people tried to make sure that it, it didn't become a bushfire, it didn't um, cause great harm, great division do any permanent damage. I can remember one particular occasion when in the Surrey Mountain Scheme, and without migrants that could not have been built, uh, somebody made the mistake of putting Croatians and Serbians in adjoining hospitals. <laughs> <laughs> and they inevitably cashed <laughs> migrant riots at uh, Kuma. <laughs> but now instead of building all of that up, as the media might do today, and television would make it even worse. Everyone, politicians, the whole lot, wanted to try and make sure that the problems were overcome. So people went and spoke to Croatians and went and spoke to Serbians. Do you want to import your old enmities or hatreds, or do you want a new country where there is faith and belief and values that can be shared and peace? And I think they might have been moved a bit apart. <laughs> uh, but that was the end of it. It was over town. So politicians refused to pay politics with race and religion. From the beginning of the migration program through the 50s, through the 1960s, and I think through the 1970s, until uh, Pauline Hansen has been mentioned. It started before Pauline Hansen when Jerry Hand, as Minister for Immigration in the Labour Party, started to put up razor wire fences for refugees, something which the Liberal Party, which had earlier opposed those moves vehemently, because those proposals were all put to my government, um, also been supported. And one thing led to another. I can remember how Hulk saying to me, we, we were I, as education minister, I was getting about 200 letters a week or more, which was quite a lot in those days, um, complaining about Asian students in schools and universities taking a place from my little Johnny. That's not meant to be Johnny now. <laughs> but the funny, well, the odd thing about those letters, 190 of the 200 came from one of the suburbs in Sydney, the environment which John Howard was brought up. The rest came from all around Australia. So there was something in Sydney, people organising, promoting discord even then. And uh, I can remember asking Harold Holt, um, you know, one day, you know, my responses to these letters were they too tough, too rough? So, and then he said, he looked at one and he said, oh, Malcolm, make it a bit tougher. <laughs> you need to take a baseball bat to these people and stop them getting their heads out of the burrows. <laughs> <laughs> once their heads are out of the burrows, it's very hard to put it back in. <laughs> well, Pauline Hansen was allowed to get out of the burrow. After Tampa, I was at the Kennedy School. There were about 18 and 20 Australian students there, and they wanted a private meeting with me. 
so it won't take long. Just a couple of questions. One question, really. How long do we have to pretend we are not Australian? Not to Tampa. That went around the world like a bushfire. And the debates that we've had between government and opposition, opposition and government, I'm not saying one is worse than the other because I think the whole lot of them should be consigned to the devil, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, those debates have gone around the world like a bushfire, too. Now, the president of Indonesia is not going to say to an Australian Prime Minister, are you going back to the days of being a white Australian policy? Is that really what you want? What are you after? Why do you only take 60 or 70 refugees out of Indonesia each year when we have so many? Now, for your quote, it's a fact you could help us a bit more if you'd take a few more. Because an engagement to all the ones I've been anyway are much politer than Australians generally are. <laughs> and uh, they're polite to people who are visitors in their country. Um, ambassadors are not going to report the current debates are doing damage in China and Japan and in different places, which they are. I had a Latvian Prime Minister saying, why are you finding it so difficult to deal with four or five thousand refugees a year when we have to deal with 400,000 a year? From Latvia. Somebody from Cyprus. What do they know? What do they care really about Australia? But they knew. Now what's the point of all of this? And this should be a celebration, a promise of diversity. <laughs> and professors of British life it's certainly a life to celebrate. But we don't need one or two of him. We need a thousand, ten thousand of them. We need to put those heads, if not the heads, the arguments, back in the barrow. And recognize that if we are to have a civilized society, there are values which we share in common. Some politicians talk about Australian values and some of the people coming here won't, uh, won't uh, you know, support Australian values. They'll, they'll destroy Australian values. I actually think the values that are important to us, if you want a peaceful society, you know, one where you can bring up your kids and give them a better education, a better opportunity than we ourselves can, I think those values are universal. I think there is something unique about Australia. But it's not in the basic values which enable human beings to live together and enjoy each other's company in society and progress in a peaceful way. So, you know, the great problem for Australia, which Tony Abbott's not going to talk about, Julie Gillard is not going to talk about, Beverly in Canberra is going to talk about. How do you put the evil genie back in the bottle? How do you debate, or stop the debate, who can be toughest, who can be nasty to people fleeing terror? If somebody tells you that the Tamil people coming here today are mostly economic refugees, well, are those processed by the toughest processing system, I think, in the entire Western world, says the 90, a little over 90%, are in fact genuine refugees fleeing the terror of the government in Sri Lanka. But the Commonwealth is honouring Sri Lanka with the Commonwealth heads of government meeting in Sri Lanka. The Canadians have said they're not going to go. We've said we are going to go. And Australia has provided money for gunboats to shoot or turn back boats as they leave Sri Lanka. We've paid for the boats so that the Sri Lankans can help us ostensibly lessen the problem that we might otherwise have. There are things we can do. We're now on the Security Council. Why don't we try and have an international campaign to get more countries to sign the Refugee Convention, which Menzies signed in 1954, which to me was the first step which meant that the white Australian policy had to go. People didn't say that at the time, but you could not honour 
that convention and still maintain the white Australian policy. But it was a case of little by little. And we could be active in the Security Council. We could be active within our own region. The <coughs> Vietnamese and no Chinese refugees came here, and I believe ethically we had no option. Josh Whitman had made a decision not to take people from that part of the world. But when that decision was altered, he never proposed it. He didn't do anything whatever to oppose it at any point. So bipartisanship and acceptance of refugees from Indochina was maintained. And that's what maintained, made it, or made that immigration to Australia so successful. But it was also a regional effort because many were fleeing in riverboats which couldn't survive at sea. Certainly not through the Indonesian pirates and as far as Darwin, but the first boat into Darwin had on it the person who was currently the Lieutenant Governor of South Australia, which was not a bad effort, but only one of many people who succeeded and done very good things for Australia and contributing to Australia and participating in Australia. And um, but the Malayans were pushing people back out to sea because they thought they'd have a great problem they couldn't handle. They decided not to do that. So long as somebody else paid for the camp, UNHCR ran it. And so long as there were commitments, which there were from Australia, Canada, and the United States to take tens of thousands of people out of those camps. So that there would not be a problem that they could not handle. And that, if you like, was a regional approach, but a wide region involving America and Canada, those two most generous countries apart from Australia in relation to that problem at that time. I don't think there's been any effort to have that kind of a regional approach in relation to today's problems. And I can well accept that numbers could get greater than could be possible for Australia to handle. That situation has not happened yet, but we get to the danger point so much more quickly because of the debates that take place. And how much of it is because a very large number of these people are Muslims. And that's different. Indo-Chinese made easier a lot of Catholics, but not all, but a lot of Buddhists, different people. So it's a religious matter as well as a racial matter. And if we're going to overcome it and get back to a better track, a great many people are going to have to be active and not just pretend that things will return to what they thought was normal before Canada, because they're not. They'll get worse. And so this is a plea. Honor the memory of Professor Zubrich Fight for the principles he stood for, and fight for the Australia, which made it so many, which made it possible for so many people to come here post the Second World War and be welcome and participate fully and equally in Australian life, and who have contributed so much to Australia, and that would be by far the best memorial.